Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Interviewing the Legends. I'm your host, Ray Shasho, a post-apocalyptic troubadour with a penchant for the sonically grotesque, self-describes Jason Beeler, singer, guitarist, and songwriter, who is most famous for playing with metal band Saigon Kick. Jason Beeler and the Baron von Bielski Orchestra's music has been described as Nordic ambient, post-classical, satanic love songs for nomadic peoples living above the Arctic Circle, catering specifically for those who staff musk oxen rescues and wear hemp-based sweaters. That's a mouthful, man. When aggressively potted for comment, the Baron says, well, art is art, isn't it? Still, on the other hand, water is water and east is east. And West is West. If you take cranberries and stew them like applesauce, they taste much more like prunes than rhubarb does. Now you tell me what you know. Fighter's new album is called Postcards from the Asylum by Jason Beeler and the Baron Von Vilsky Orchestra, the follow-up to 2021's critically acclaimed Songs for the Apocalypse. The new single Heathens is available now on Spotify or Apple Music, and you can pre- Pre-order it at the the new album at jasonbeeler.bandcamp.com. Please welcome singer, guitarist, and songwriter Jason Beeler to interviewing the legends. Hello, Jason. How are you? How's it going, man? Living the dream. Living the dream. I can tell. I'm going to be perfectly honest with you here. Sure. I did not know what to expect from this album when it was sent to me. I just saw the crazy photos of you from around the web i expected a dark and bizarre album kind of zappa like um someone referred to you as a modern day frank zappa i disagree i think you're much better than zappa i never liked zappa's lyrics it was i thought it was ridiculous that he was such a talented man he could have done much better with his lyrics i could never take his lyrics or singing seriously only his guitar playing this is seriously a great album, and I really sincerely mean that. Thank you very much. I mean, first of all, I, I know they're going to clip that into Beeler thinks he's better than Zappa. <laughs> that'll be the next, that'll be the web. Uh, so thanks for that avalanche of hate. I will shoot and receive for all the uh, from all the Zappa fans. But no, but thanks so much, man. I'm glad, I'm glad you liked it. You know, any press is good press. You know that. That is true. <laughs> well, my words. I said it was an eclectic all inspiring blend of profound rock hymns performed impeccably by accomplished and innovative artists. The album has all the elements needed for a great album. It's almost like a legendary rock opera or a concept album in the making. And I gave it five stars. Oh man. Thank you so much. That's awesome. It's incredible. It it really surprised the heck out of me, man. Um, I don't think we should go on any further because you can only get worse from this point. (laughs) We're done. <laughs> I, I, I believe in ending on a high note. You know, I don't. Know. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Yeah, <laughs> that was a Seinfeld episode too. I think I liked that. But you had some cool um, guests on the on the uh, on the album. Go, name some of the the guests you have on the album besides Marco. Marco Miniman, obviously, just an absolute freak of a musician and a wonderful guy. Uh, Todd Kearns from Slash's band and uh, a band Took he's been in. Uh, kind of a legendary prog keyboard player, Rio Akamoto. Uh, my right hand man, Andy Blacksugar, who's plays with everybody from Peter Murphy to Blondie to KMFDM. Uh, just a brilliant guitar player. Uh, a Brazilian German named Edu Comanato, who's again just phenomenal musician. Uh, a friend of mine, Ricky Sanders, who also played on the last record on a track. Uh, and my old bandmate from Saigon Kick, Chris McLernan, joined us on one track. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, and and obviously on the last record as well, I I just I've been so blessed with uh, everybody from Butch Walker to Devin Townsend, Clint Lowry from Seven Dust, Bumblefoot, uh, you know Clay Cook from the Zac Brown Band. Uh, it just goes on and on. I mean, I just I, I have a wealth of riches of friends I can guilt into playing on my records. Now this is your voice on the record, is that right? Yes. Uh, let me tell you, man. There's something the voice and lyrical structure. Is very impressive the way it blends in. I don't know if you got that um, voice, like a double track voice in a lot of these in a lot of these songs, but I don't know how you do it. But the the quality 
the engineering uh it's it's very well done you know oh, thanks man. very yeah, very sure. professional and i i, I really enjoyed the album man i was like i said it's it's a great great album uh i'm gonna go over some tracks with you if sure. i can okay uh it, it starts out with bombay uh very you know and, it, and again the album's eclectic it's not just all heavy metal and you know it's it's all over the place you got prog you know, you got some slow tunes on this, you know, very beautiful tracks, by the way. But Bombay does start out rocking. And uh, very. It, it's also cinematic. A lot of people are using that word a lot today, cinematic. Yeah. Especially with prog. And you really cross over into pro progressive rock a lot, don't you? You know, I mean, I've been really lucky that I never even thought about, you know, I've always been a kind of person who's, you know, growing up, I was in a lot of trouble because I would listen to Barry Manilow and Metallica. <laughs> So, you know, I, I had a hard time sitting at the right lunch table at school because as soon as someone would, you know, I'd be like, have you heard the new Bananarama? And, you know, I love the sugar. And so, um, but fortunately, I think times have changed a lot to where now people are really just more focused on uh, my personality disorder is more acceptable at this point in terms of music than it was as a kid. Um, so I, I've always just loved all kinds of music. And the prog audience it's a really big blanket term. Like I didn't really know much about it when I was growing up. I thought prog meant you played Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> you know, every song was about a wizard on some kind of mystic right, right. Or something like that. Uh, but what it really seems to mean it, it it's the most embracing genre out there. I mean, it you is. can you can do anything, and they'll you know as long as you're pushing the envelope in whatever way you do it, um, they're kind of really accepting, and and they're they, they're they're definitely less rule bound and less dogma based you know it's kind of like they're just looking for something you know they, they're almost encouraging you to push buttons and try try stuff it's and that's more cool, yeah that's what makes it special to me it's more intricate um it you know it, it's more intelligent music better lyrics better music better uh musicians you know than just the heavy metal stuff but now they've got metal prog that's right. the new thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, it, it's been so cool to me that they've, they've kind of taken me under the, even the last record, we started getting all these prog reviews and it was like, wow, this yep. is amazing. And it brought a whole new audience to what I do that I that had no concept of my previous career, which is a great thing because usually you don't get that kind of second look. Right. You know, when you've had a career doing one thing, it's like, that's who you are. I mean, maybe maybe Floggy Molly from uh, Fast Way, you know, mm -hmm. transitioning from Fast Way to Floggy Molly, that kind of worked, but most people don't get to outlive their past. And uh, it's really cool that, that that whole, you know, scene has kind of accepted me and what we're doing and it's kind of neat. Yeah, you're really seen in, in, a, in a different light now, which is cool. Yeah. You know, because, you know, if you were doing the same thing as you did uh, before, you know, you know, people might question that a little bit. It, it's good, but you know, he's got to do something different. But this, this album really, you know, stands out, and you, you should be very proud of this album. I really mean that. I appreciate that, man. Yeah, Heathens. That's the new single. Um, great rhythm. Uh, it's a, it's another rocker. I heard a little Alice Cooper in there for some reason. I don't know where I heard that, but no, nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Yep. Sometimes Alice gets out there too and does a little bit, you know, he changes from his norm. Um, you know what's a great tune? Mexico. Oh man, thanks. It's been you coming know? up a lot, which is awesome. Acoustic. Your acoustic playing is great, man. You know, and that, yeah. that's how you can tell what, what, a, what a great guitar player is when he can be a great acoustic player and a great electric player, you know, not just an electric player. And I heard a little Leon Russell like in that song. Also, I mean, who doesn't love Leon Russell? Yeah, maybe in the maybe in the beginning of the tune, but that's a very good song. Thank you, man. A couple of your tracks, I heard some '60s feeling in it. Um, Birds of Prey, kind of a little bit of '60s in there, which is great. Um, flying monkeys, talk about flying monkeys. That was very intricate track. And that may be the one that kind of, to me, it sounded a little Zappa, a little Gentle Giant in a way, you oh, know? Wow. <laughs> it's, it was cool. an ingenious track. Thanks, man. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 um, it was a rhythmic thing I was working on. And I happened to meet Marco Miniman in L.A. Right. As I was writing, and I was like, dude, I have this track. And if there's a drummer on the planet, 
that could take this, you know, and really, I said, you know, it's weird because no, normally when you're producing a track, you're always telling the musicians to not overplay. Exactly. Like just, just do, but in this case, like he was looking at me, are you serious? I'm like, dude, go nuts. Like do anything that comes to mind. Like this is a track that I want to bring out. It, it just seemed like the marriage between him and his insane alien ability and this track would be a perfect marriage mm -hmm. and he you know it, like sent me back like within a couple of hours like the track you and i was like that's it i mean he's just such a monster and i think he brought brought a lot of really he flips things on every verse every pre he's always evolving the track yeah. into something new and when you think he's already played that bag of tricks the next one changes again and it does something completely and he you know just where he's throwing his you know the accents in and everything like that it's just you know it, and that's a track that i mean selfishly but drummer should hear what he's done on that track. You know, it's so great to find a guy like like him that uh, you can collaborate with. You know, yeah. like for all those reasons. You know, well, all your all your longtime fans are going to love "Sick Riff." I mean, that's you know, very heavy, hard, rock, a very cool track, though. You know, Thanks, doesn't sound like anything else. It's you know, great song, man. It, it, where, where did sick uh, riff come come from? Was that just a sick riff? <laughs> it was kind of joking around because, like you know, every band, especially in the heavy genre, I was I always mock. You know, every press release always has, and this is our heaviest record yet. Right. You know? And I'm like, I, I don't care anymore. I like that's <laughs> a good record. I don't care how heavy your record is. Like, exactly. Um. So it was always like joking around. You know, a sick riff, man. Oh, that's a sick riff. So right. Um. It, it, it's it's meant ironically, not uh, self. You know. Uh, labeling uh but uh yeah it was it was an odd time as well it's kind of a you know it's cycle of 12 that riff is so it's kind of a little throwback to some of the early sound garden kind of riff mm -hmm. you know where it's, exactly. it's not landing exactly where the cycle's a lot longer yep not not quite mashuga but somewhere between mashuga and uh sound garden <laughs> um, happy to land. the and, other uh, thing they always mention they always say he oh, always a master shredder you know yeah. master shredder you know i always hear that a lot yeah, it's a ridiculous shred tasticness, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Another great acoustic thing is uh, the depths, um, which I I found to be prog, you know. Oh, cool, great vocals in that song. Thank you. Um, that's I think that's one of my favorite. As a matter of fact, the depths. I really enjoy that tune, man. I was pretty happy with that. I mean, normally I've always kind of written kind of more. From an abstract point of view, you know, I, I, I've always envied like the ability of like a Bruce Springsteen or an Elvis Costello to like tell you a story of where like I went to the garage, I grabbed this kind of wrench, I put it on a bolt that was this shape, and I tightened it in my car. You know, there's all sorts of literal storytelling, or even some of the great Tom Petty <clears> stuff. <throat> and I've right. never been able to kind of articulate that, but this song, I think, kind of lyrically, I felt kind of delivered a point. You know, had a little more of a narrative that I was kind of proud of when I finished it. And it's kind of fun to tell a story like that too, isn't it? It's like writing a book. As know? long as you have a good story, half the time when I get done with stuff, you're like, that's terrible. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you got a lot of stories though. <laughs> oh, yeah. A couple. <laughs> Beneath the waves. Uh, kind of psychedelic flair to that, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. You know, yeah. You, you can never get enough psychedelic sound, you know, even today, you know? No, I mean, that's the track that Todd Kearns plays on as well from Slash's band. So he, uh, yep. he, we were talking, you know, we've, he's done some shows. I do some shows with Jeff Scott Soto and me. We do these acoustic shows on occasion. We have all these different special guests. So getting to know these guys and some of their musical background and things that they love and, you know, pulling from the same references, uh, it was kind of neat to have him on that track. Yeah, I had um, Derek Sherinian on the show from Sons oh, yeah. of Apollo, who, with Jeff sings on that. It's so cool because these guys, all you guys now, you don't just – play in one band and there's like three or four different bands that you guys are all playing in man especially in the prog rock era you know which is cool it's a good idea actually especially the way the, the, the music business is today right for sure uh sweet eliza great tune there's a little bit in there that's kind of sounded indian in psychedelic flair very mm -hmm. short ditty there that that i really enjoyed um 9981 darkness right there's a top 40 feel to that one. That was a very well put together, um, very well constructed song. Talk about that and why why is that called that? 
Um, I'm not one to discuss the origins of that song, but it came yeah. about from a. Uh, I, I got into really composing with these heavy orchestration, uh, orchestrated uh, horn sounds, like a dark brass orchestra kind of sound. Right. So it kind of came about from this ominous kind of chording of some of those horns that sound so like when they're almost distorted and re they just sound ominous. Mm -hmm. So the initial kind of chord chordal structure of it came from that. And then, uh, you know, I've always been really a fan of kind of juxtaposing, you know, ominous with melodic or really melodic with really horrifyingly gross lyrics. Right. Or you know, like I, I like to just have things float in multiple areas at the same time. So the song kind of grew out of that kind of, that one I think ha has more of a cinematic feel, uh, you know, in terms of the, the horn sections of it. So that, I, uh, that was a fun track to do. Yep. That's a great song. Thanks. Um, you know, like I, I was a top 40 DJ back in the late seventies. So I, I always picked, you know, the the hit songs. If radio was only the way it used to be, you know, right. today it sucks. You know, terrestrial radio sucks. Yeah, I mean, you can find stuff on, um, you, you know, blog radio and things like that. But you know, mainstream radio is ridiculous nowadays. But that that could have ended up in a top forty uh, radio station. You know, that was that good. Could have been awesome. on the on the hit list. Um, feels just like love. That's another hard rocker as well. Love that tune. Now here, this song is is really clever. And Bear uh, Sedatives. So cool. um, background kind of sounds like Tomorrow Never Knows, you know, the beat. Yeah. It's like, it, you know, and of course you got that kind of Beatles backward sound, electric guitar sound in it. Talk about this one, man, that's great. Yeah, I mean, it just that that title came to me. I don't even know what I was doing. It just, I just <laughs> thought bear sedatives, and you know, it, was, it, it was even it was before uh, it was before Cocaine Bear. So yeah. uh, you know, I, it was, uh, maybe that'll be the sequel to Cocaine Bear, <laughs> Bear Sedatives after that, in the second movie. But um, yeah, it just kind of write, writes its. I mean, I have a real. I wouldn't say it, it's. A, I'm lucky in the sense that things like I didn't even realize half the stuff I had done until I kind of compiled the whole record. And sat back and like listened to it. That's crazy. Even my wife was threatening to like, maybe we shouldn't be sleeping in the same room anymore because these lyrics are screwy. Like, <laughs> we have issues. But a lot of it I don't even realize. And it's funny, the guy who does all my art, Robert Merrick, who's right. brilliant. He, uh, you know, he he was sitting back saying it's almost like a con, like you said, almost like a concept record. Yes, it is. It, it just kind of comes out of me, so I don't really know half the time what I'm doing or I, you know what I don't question it or think about it too much. It's it's more like kind of a uh, channeling it in a way. That's amazing. Um, so yeah, that a lot of the stuff kind of, I, I get to kind of, when I actually listen back to them, like as surprised as sometimes other people are, I'm like, wow, that's kind of, hmm. you got quite a talent there, man, a gift. Or, 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 or a problem, depending on how you, <laughs> <laughs> hey, they both work, <laughs> hey, exactly. whatever pays the bills, exactly. fine line between, a, between a, a, a dancing monkey and a dancer, right? <laughs> you could also turn this album into kind of a rock opera in a way, you know? Yeah. Kind of, yeah. Um, Deep Blue is kind of a spy espionage theme song, which yeah, which I, yeah, which I thought was very very cool. And um, Human Head, I was afraid to to listen to that one until I heard the song. I said, Human Head, oh this this has to be grotesque, but the it's, it's a beautiful tune, man. Oh. You know, and it's a great end an ending to a fantastic album. It really is. Where'd yeah. you come? Where'd you come up with the human head? <laughs> Again, sometimes like I, I don't even know what came into my head, but it it was just like uh, that first line. You know, I bought a human head right. and placed it on my shelf. Uh huh. You know, and then it, you know it watches over me and no one else. Kind of, and then it just my brain just went into over, and it just all kind of came out. It was like a lot of times that like that like a concept or a little lyric or a phrase will hit, and then the songs kind of for me tend to kind of write themselves. Right. And that's one of the ones in particular where my wife is like, you might want to talk to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> well, five stars all the way for the album. I love it. It's 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 really uh, uh, well-produced, engineered, uh, lyrically content, great musician. I mean, it's got it all, man. It, it's a really good album. I was very, very impressed by it. Um, it, it it's up there with all the great prog albums, in my opinion. Oh, you man, know? I really, really appreciate that. Thanks. It, you know, it we just really got, is. 
it's just getting out there. And like when you yep. make these kind of records, you don't know what the hell you've done. Right. So you're, you're waiting to hear what people kind of think about it. So to hear that from you is great. I think they're going to love it. I really do. Where, where did the concept of the uh, Baron von Bilski uh, orchestra come from? Where did that come from? Um, when we were started the, the last record, you know, I wanted to put up, you know, I'm a big fan of like, strange enough, all the old vaudeville stuff and like the kind oh. of you know, traveling road show type of premises. And and uh, the fact that this, <clears throat> this really was a no rules kind of, we can do anything project. Like we can go anywhere. We can do any kind of music we want. Anybody can participate in it at any time. All my friends, musicians, different, you know, whether they're j jazz musicians or metal, or you can kind of pull it all. So the, it just sounded like a great kind of catch-all right. for, for um, there's no expectation when you hear it, but it's not like, you know, the band's name is Damage or yeah. where, well, yeah. you know, you kind of expect it or it's going to kind of sound like one thing. Um, so, yeah, it was more from a freedom standpoint of like, no one's going to pigeonhole that name. Yep. Into having to do anything. And uh, it, it's kind of like you left it open to invite other musicians and different musicians into the band. Absolutely. You know? That's the most important thing to me. I've been very lucky that I've developed a, you know, a, a kind of cultish following of people who, yeah. if I made a, if I made a straight record, they'd kill me. Right. Like, I, I have the opposite problem of most people, you know, like they really like their favorite things are when they're thrown. Mm -hmm. and they didn't expect, like that's their favorite element. I had no idea we were going to do that. Or I yeah. didn't expect that. That's kind of what they've grown to expect. Right. Um, and that's a great place to be because you don't feel like, you know, I mean, I've always ama I've been amazed by like ACDC, who's amazing. Mm -hmm. They make that one record. Right. It's great. And you know what you're going to get every time you pick up that record. Yeah. And, and it's brilliant. Uh, I've never been able to do that. So to find a group of people that like encourage me to lose control of my taste mm -hmm. is fantastic but you are kind of eclectic though you can do anything if you really want to you know I, which I is good from, I, i've i grew up you know unlike a lot not everybody but I mean, i'm sure a lot of people also but like i just always loved music yeah so like whether it was miles davis or you know elvis costello or tom waits or bjork or mm -hmm. you know uh you know king crimson or you know primus or I just love stuff that I love, you know, right. that, that, that comes from a real place. So I think the important thing with doing anything diverse is it's got to come from a place of like, I love and respect this type of music, not, you just can't do it for the sake of, oh, it'll be neat if I play, you know, folk music here. Yep. I, I think there's got to be a kind of inherent love for that, or, you know, just a passion for that, that kind of music. And I, I've been just lucky that I'm allowed to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I always admired Richie Blackmore, what he did with, uh, you know, Blackmore's Night. Yeah. With Candace, you know, he did the things that, I mean, it's totally opposite of everything he's done. But, but he it's loves so, it. He loves it, and it's so good, you know. And he, and he brought brought some, uh, he's got a whole new crowd now, you know, of, of listeners. Uh, how long did it take you to make this album? Uh, probably around... Give or take two months. No, you're yeah. kidding me. From, from start, from writing to the music and everything. Sense. That's really incredible, sense, man. Yeah, I don't know how you it, do it. Once it started to come together, it kind of fell in place quick. Well, like you said, it's just flowing out of you. You just got that knack, you know? Well, I'm lucky so far, right? It comes out and then you listen to it later. <laughs> and then say, hmm, let me listen to it now. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm only confident when I'm finished that I've either made the worst record in history or a great record. I have, <laughs> somewhere in between, I'm sure something happened. But yeah, yeah you, you, you never know. I mean, I'm sure it's just like you, you know, when you do an interview, you like sometimes you feel you're doing a great interview. Right. And, back to it and you're like, oh my God, that's terrible. I and know. then sometimes you think an interview is not great. And you listen back and you're like, my, that was the best one ever. You know, it's a, I think it's the same as making a record or writing a book or anything. You're never a hundred percent sure you're not what you're doing. Yeah, that's true. I interview some people that, you know, I'll, I'll put a promo out there coming up. I'll, I'll be interviewing this guy. And I said, man, I probably won't get too much response. And he'll have the biggest response over some legendary artists. And I'll go, what? Really? Where did that come from? You know? You never know. It's your interviewing you, skills. You just never happen. Yeah. yeah. You just never know. That's, that's why they always say, you know, you can't always pick the people you like. 
you know, it's, it's the same thing with promoting concerts, you know, you can't yeah. always bring in people that you like, you know, it's gotta be, you gotta go, you know, gotta be eclectic, you know, just like you did on this album. It was a great album. Um, so did, did you accomplish everything on this album? Like you, you thought you would? I, I think, I mean, I, I'm proud of it. Um, you know, I'm excited to see what, how everybody feels about it, but I'm already thinking of next, you know what I mean? I'm kind of, yeah. the next. you know, I, t I tend not to really, and not because I disrespect people's moment of liking a record. It's just for me, while I'm able to do it, I just tend to always look for the next adventure, you know, sure. the next, next challenge. And, and not that I, I mean, I, there's always a thing about musicians, you know, like people love records when they were kids and they're, they're imprints on you when you're young and they're always going to be important records for exactly. those reasons. But from my perspective, music is one of those things, you know, unlike I have friends that play professional sports mm -hmm. and uh, you know, there's a finite window of when you're going to be good. You know, like at some point, 30, 35, mm -hmm. maybe if you're super lucky, 40, you're done. Right. And music's one of those few things where, you know, I, I, I feel like I, I still get better. Yeah, doesn't mean necessarily that's, that's going to be doesn't mean it's going to be a bigger record or more or have more hits, but I just feel personally like I'm playing with the best musicians I've ever played with, and I feel like I'm pushing myself harder and and, and in better ways than I ever have. So that's what keeps me excited about. It. What about touring? Are you going to tour soon or? We're looking at doing some stuff. I mean, I feel like this not from an ego standpoint. Mm -hmm. These two records, I've released two double records. Have been the first two records, right? Um, they deserve a, a a production level to them that I want to make sure I I give them when we're going to actually tour. So I just don't want to like jump and do a couple of support things and and have it not be fully realized as to what you know these records could be. Um, so we're we're uh, looking at different opportunities and different options. So hopefully you know towards the end of the year we'll we'll start to put some days together. I think you need a headline number one and present this music the album kind of like a i don't know like genesis you know like play the whole album you know right. that kind of thing you know because it deserves awesome. that it really does i think the people would enjoy that more like you said you don't want to be an opening act or not from an ego like standpoint i just yeah. i mean i don't care if i headline in front of you know 300 people's fine right exactly i just want the i want the record and the the concept to come across the way it should. Exactly. I agree with you. How about, um, you going to do any visuals you think with a concert for, with this album? Yeah, we're definitely working on a bunch of different videos, um, and a, a bunch of different video content and cool stuff. I just want to make sure too, like it, it's in, in this day and age, it just seems like a lot of people are just, again, no disrespect to what anybody does, but they're, right. you know, they're filming videos on their laptop in front of a green screen and like, right. You know, and, I, and and not that uh, I'm anything wonderful to look at, but I want to make sure that the visuals live up to the music, live up to the artwork. I, I don't want to just do anything so I can have some YouTube hits. I want I to agree. make sure there's some substance to it. Yeah. And uh, so that takes a little more time and a little more budget and a little more being focused on, you know, some really great creative teams, but we're, we're on it. And uh, I'm excited to see what we all come up with. So And it's worth it. It really is. Well, I, I pulled... You are a Prague fan, obviously, and I found somewhere that you picked your, I think, your five favorite prog rock songs. Oh, I mean, wow, let, yeah. Let's see if it still stands up to the test of time. And I agree with all of them. Um, Genesis, Squonk. Yeah. Still one of your favorites? Still. still one of, I mean, the, I should give you a little background on that if you have a second. It's just, sure, of course. I got asked to play with this amazing drummer named Jonathan Mover. Okay. And he was putting together this band called Project, which had him, uh, Michael Sadler from Saga. Yeah. Uh, Rio Michael. Akimoto. Yeah. And now Mike Keneally's playing with him, but I was playing guitar before that. Right. And uh, he, they really gave me a crash course in Prague that I was not as aware of. Like those guys lived and breathed and like Mover would sit down with me with, you know, all these obscure, like, you know, King Crimson out takes from this and like you never heard this version of that and then when they played it live in paris they did this and you know and, and the bruford stuff and the gentle giant stuff so yeah in a weird way like the prog the true prog stuff because when i was growing up you know genesis was hits genesis and right. yes was hits yes it wasn't like the 20 minute song yes exactly stuff. yeah um so 
all those tracks really were as fun as as much as it seems like oh he must have really loved i i really discovered those in the last four or five years mm. yeah trick of the tail is one of my favorite genesis albums love it i've had steve hackett on the show and we've discussed the album um, I had, you know, I had Simon Collins on recently. He's got a new album out. He's got a new band now called E Molecule. Oh wow! Which is very good, very very prog. He's a he's a nice guy too, really good guy. Uh, your second song, you said King Crimson, Lux Tongues and Aspic Part One. Uh huh. I have talked about this with David Cross. I know David. He's a he's another good guy. Um, uh, that, that's a very intricate tune, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> love King Crimson, man. You can't, you got to love King Crimson. Like, again, like having to learn that song, cause we were playing that with Mover and everything like that. It was just such an eye opener. I mean, I've always been a guitar player and, but you know, and I've always known Fripp was like a mad genius and, you yes. know, you, but until you really start to take the things apart, you don't realize how much of a mad genius. I mean, especially when you think of that, I think that track was 69, 70, 71. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's, it's like light years ahead of Prague now. It is, you know, it's, it's just insanely brilliant. So you're kind of headed that way. I think that's why I, that's why I love the album so much. You're getting, you're getting intricate. You're getting really into it now. I mean, into different things. And it's definitely changed me in a really, really interesting. I way. like that direction. I really do. Thanks, I hope you keep it up. You know, sure. Um, Haken, I just had Ross Jennings on the show. What a what a what a mega dude! Any cool? Yeah. <laughs> Cockroach King, another one of your favorite tunes, right? Yeah, just just think the world of that band and that song in particular. That was the song that I kind of discovered him by, and I was just like, my God, this band is brilliant, you know? Yeah, Ross is a good guy too. Yeah. Um, Devin Towson, Evermore. Yep, another favorite. I love Devin. I mean, I, I think Devin's the, you know, such an, I mean, obviously he's done really well for himself, but I, I still think he's, you know, people don't realize the genius that is Devin Townsend. Yep. I agree with you. So much depth, so much, uh, his spirit of adventure, especially in the face of a difficult music business, like we talked about, mm -hmm. like Devin will go, all right, he'll have a massive successful thing and he'll go, I can't do that. I'm going this way now. And just, right. he'll, he'll just leap into these new endeavors fearlessly yep. and uh, that only makes the base of people who love him love him more uh and just what a talent and and he's been so good to me um like i said he guessed it on the last record i did mm -hmm. and uh you know funny enough he was at a saigon kick show when he was a little kid in vancouver so we met like 30 years ago um, wow really very yeah, so cool like, yeah so it's kind of a neat thing but yeah i think the world of Devin. your fifth favorite album uh song is by mr jason beeler <laughs> was it analyze oh, oh yeah um <laughs> i i don't believe i meant to put myself in the legendary prog category why not <laughs> but, uh, maybe that was a cheap ploy to get someone to pay attention go that, that idiot didn't name himself Let me hear <laughs> you, you've got some funny stuff on your on your website you know funny you know um quotes and and things like that what's with the the uh the hand model were you actually a hand model no, no. <laughs> uh, I've I've abused the internet in every possible sense of misinformation <laughs> that I could. Uh, I, I I believe in promoting nothing, but nothing's true, nothing's real. I just I just whatever comes to my mind at the moment, I put out there. And the art guy I work with has done this unbelievable job of photoshopping just these insane pictures and stuff like that. They're, um, they're so great. You know? He's done such a good job of that, and, and it's caused so many funny problems, including like one with Michael Sadler. Right. When I was going to do the project thing, he and his wife went online to see who this Jason guy was because he didn't mm -hmm. wasn't really familiar with me, and he comes up with this Photoshop thing of me completely ripped with like tattoos all over I me. I saw that. <laughs> so his wife's going, "You have to go to the gym and get in shape if you're going to be in a band with this guy. You can't be out of shape." So like six weeks prior to us going to rehearsal. Michael joins a CrossFit. He's on mm -hmm. di he's dieting. Wow! All because of, all because of the Photoshop. That's, that was that's a real true. disappointment in person. <laughs> you know, I, I wasn't a hundred percent sure what you were going to look like today because from all those pictures, I said, "Is this guy ripped? He's got tattoos all over him, and is he like a biker dude?" You know. <laughs> Don't get me wrong; I am completely ripped. <laughs> 
I also like to picture you with the mini, the mini me. You, oh, you yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. And it's funny because you, you said you go back to the, uh, the old days, you know, and, and it's true. You got kind of pictures that kind of resemble the, the old days, you know, back yeah, in the I, 1920s. I, just want to, you know, I want people to like the music. I want to entertain. I want people to have a good time. I want I, I don't want to do the sure. typical. Yeah. I, I, if I see one more band photo, I, I, right. kill, I, I can't stand it. And not that I mean, more power to anybody who's whatever you do to do your thing. I mean, that's just for me, it's like, you know, how many more guys do you got to see? Yeah, exactly. It's like, it could be some kind of interference or something from somewhere. What, uh, so what's going on with Saigon Kick? Is that totally defunct or do you think it is? Yeah, I mean, uh, there, there's a couple of interesting, I mean, they're, they're reissuing a lot of the catalog on vinyl, which is super cool. Right. And um, things like that. But, you know, I, I don't, I, I don't believe, you know, I, it doesn't hold the interest for me. Right. Um, no disrespect to anybody else, but I'm sure everybody's had bad relationships. Uh, it's just, you know, it, it's better to sit in the past. We may eventually consider doing, you know, a, a special night of something here or there, but in terms of new music or really touring or anything like that, uh, at the moment, I never say never, but at the moment, it's the furthest thing from my uh, my mind. Hmm. You still got a lot of fans out there too. A lot yeah, of man, people that I, love, I totally love that respect, band. you know, that, yeah. that I'm so grateful for. And, right. you know, a chunk of them have followed me around and helped me out, do all the kind of stuff I do. So I don't take that at all for granted. Right. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, I'm kind of happy where I'm at at the moment. Sure. I don't blame you, man. Um, here, here's a funny question. If, if you weren't doing music, what, you, what would you be doing right now? <laughs> I say this. In all seriousness, I'd, I'd probably be in an institution somewhere. <laughs> and your and wife I, would put you in it. <laughs> and, and, and my wife would be the first one signing the paper. Yeah, I, I mean, music's just been that thing for me since I was a little kid. Like when I first started hearing it as early I, as I remember it, like I felt like I understood it. Right. Me too. Felt like it understood me. Yeah. I mean, I felt like I was having conversation in a, in a really weird way. So without having that kind of sense of expression um, and that kind of outlet, uh, I don't know what nefarious endeavors I would have been up to, uh, you know, with misdirected youth and angst. Uh, uh, I, I fear the worst. <laughs> That's funny. How, how long have you been married? We've been together since I was 15 years old. Oh, wow. Congratulations. She was 15 as well. So, yeah, we've been together yeah. a long time. High school? From high school? Even before high school, yeah. Even before high school. Wow. That's great. I just celebrated 40 years with my wife. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. There's Do like you have four, kids? There's like four of us that have been married. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Do you have children? Yep, I have two. My son's old? 22, my daughter's 26. Oh, really, man? You don't look it. You know, if you shaved your beard, you look like you were 28 years old. I look like I'm Opie. From yeah. My- <laughs> <laughs> Grandkids yet? No, no. I got five. Really? <laughs> yeah. For you, man. I... Mm-hmm. I for a thirty-year-old guy, I mean, how that—that's yeah. impossible. I don't, I don't want to do the math here to get, but yeah, man, I just turned sixty-four. I can't Did believe you really. It. Yeah. Man, you look great. Thank you, thank you. Appreciate that. Here's a question. It's funny, I ask it, it's funny when we were kids, though. Like you know, I, I always tell my kids, like you know, when I was in my teens and twenties, like, and I'd see like someone thirty years old, I'd be like, why are you even out in public? I know. Like, I know. like why do you even? I mean, that's such an old person. Like, aren't you? Like, don't you want to? You know, now, like, you know, the queen dies at like 98. I'm like, right in her prime. Exactly. <laughs> she had so yeah. much more to give. Exactly right. Yeah, my dad passed away last year. He was 97. And my mom was 93. And it still feels uh, like way too, you know, as the, yeah. as our lives kind of get old, you start going like, 60's not really that old anymore. No. Like, 70's not really that old. It's just amazing. Well, they say 60's a new 50, 50's a new 40, you know, that, that kind of thing. But you know what? People in my dad's generation are living longer. In our, my generation, they're going early. There's a lot of people. I've lost a lot of people already. A lot of stress. good friends. You know? I don't know. It's a stress thing, I think. People just are are wound exceptionally tight. They are. Of our generation. And yeah. uh, that stress will get you. It's kind of weird. It's kind of scary, too, I guess. Yeah. All right, here's your question. This is the final question. This is a question I ask everybody. I get some very interesting answers. 
if you had a field of dreams wish like the movie to perform collaborate with anyone from the past or present who would that be i get asked a variation on that question a couple mm -hmm. times and my honest answer is i fear my idols right meaning well, like it, yeah. it's a really weird thing for me to say like you know if only me and bowie mm -hmm. could have done something together you know i mean like or me and prince could have worked together it really, I like I just can't ever put myself mentally in the place of like thinking that way. Um so it, it, it's like I mean I've had a lot of really lucky things. Like I guess the closest to the field of dreams for me would be the first rock concert I ever saw was Ozzy Osbourne mm -hmm. with Randy Rhodes on guitar. Wow. So it was like Randy Rhodes, Rudy Aldridge, uh nice. Rudy I'm sorry, Rudy Zarzo, Tommy Aldridge. Right. Um, and then when Saigon kickstarted, we got to open for Ozzy in Japan at the Budokan. Very cool. And I became friends with Zach, and yep. Zach had me standing behind his amps while they were playing at the Budokan after we played. And it was like this Lion King moment of like being the kid in that crowd, looking at watching Ozzy play, to being on stage as Ozzy's mm -hmm. playing with, you know, Zach and becoming friends. So that was like a real... You know, as close as I think I'll ever get to a field of dreams, like, you know, moment of like having that come full circle, uh, which was pretty awesome. You know, a lot of people are afraid of their heroes, even to talk to them. It's so funny. I talked to John Anderson, you know, from Yes. Oh, yeah. He met George Harrison. And I said, well, what did you say to him? I said, not much. He says, I was, I was afraid. I said, what do you mean you're afraid? You're John Anderson of Yes. He says, yeah, but that's a beetle. That's a yeah. beetle. <laughs> <laughs> the Beatles get get a whole different level of a uh, I know of respect, but yeah, man, I, I get that totally because it's like, well, too, I I mean, I would never want to have it be go horrible. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I, it's like you know, I have such awe of Bowie, and if I met him, was sitting and talking, and he was a dick for any reason, and, and he's and he's a lovely guy, so I'm sure he wouldn't have been. It's it's right. this is all about my problems and my own mental head. Yeah, but I'd be, I never want that to be ruined. Like Bowie and I had the best relationship I could ever imagine. His mm -hmm. music, right. I grew up with it. I loved everything he ever did. Sure. I think he's a genius. Every interview I read, I loved, and we never had a bad. You know what I mean? Like it, it, there was no risk, right, of it of it not coming off. And the same thing with Prince and all the guys that I loved, yeah. like that. You know, uh, the Beatles and everything. Like it, it kind of worked out okay. Yeah, Robin Trower said he would never get on the stage with Jimi Hendrix. It's so funny. So his his favorite, uh, he, he said James Brown. That, wow. That's what, yeah, because he, he's got some R&B in his music as well. I, mean, I get that, though, because I mean, we toured with Cheap Trick. Yep. And I was a massive Cheap Trick fan, and they would ask right. me to come up and jam, and I would disappear in a cater. I couldn't, <laughs> couldn't get my head wrapped around, like, being on stage with Cheap Trick. It was like, there's no, you know... It was just, I don't know. It's, it's my own problem, and and, and I'm yeah. probably, I'll, I'll probably look back as a as hopefully as an older man going like, what was I thinking? That was such an opportunity to you know, but I just couldn't get my head wrapped around it. You know, I love guys that like to uh, collaborate. You know, like Jeff Beck. Jeff Beck collaborated with everybody. You know, yeah. I interviewed Beth Hart. And Beth Hart was with Jeff Beck. Um, you know, Jan Hammer played with Jeff Beck. You know, I, I, you know. He was such a, you know, that, that's one guy I'm going to really miss. That, right, that one really hit me hard, you know? When, yeah, I mean, when, Jeff is one yeah. of those guys, I think, and it's no, I'm not saying anything anybody hasn't said a thousand times already, but right. Um, there's not, there's no more of that. Exactly. That was, that was it. You know what that I mean? Was that was it. That, that was the full supply of what that was. And, uh, yep. You know, uh, and, and one of those guys, I think the only other musician I feel similarly about in this sense. Every time I heard Jeff Beck play or mm -hmm. heard a song by Jeff Beck, he got better. Yes. Like I, better than I remember the last time I heard it. Like I was like, right. man, he's even better. And yeah. it just keeps happening year after year. Like you listen to the songs, you're like, I, I can't believe he's even better than I thought he was. And Freddie Mercury's voice does that for me to this day too. Like every time I listen to Freddie again, I'm like, my God, he's even better than I like remembered him being. Like exactly. he just yeah. keeps getting better. And that's the sign of, you know, one of, a handful of musicians in right. history that I think can have that effect on people. And, you know, I think that's going to happen to you. I think you're going to get better and better and you're going to find more intricate stuff to do and you're going to get very creative. 
you won't know you're doing it creatively until after you listen to the album. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Right. Whatever works. <laughs> Well, that's a huge, uh, a huge burden to live up to. So So what's next for Jason Beeler? Okay. You want to work on some new music. You're thinking about doing a tour, putting together. We're doing, we're going to think about doing some tour dates. I'm doing a bunch of shows with my friend, Jeff Scott Soto, who we talked about a little earlier, um, which is kind of like a throwback comedy, uh, songs thing. We're going on the monsters of rock cruise. uh, Oh, cool. Good, good. uh, April. That's a good cruise. That's a a good one. one. (laughs) <laughs> it's a lot of fun. And then, uh, yeah, we're doing a bunch of dates through like, you know, June, July, uh, September, October. Good. Uh, just staying creative and music. You know, I, I can't be thankful enough. Well, come Pretty to Florida people. for sure, man. I'm, I'm, sure, in the Tampa, I'm in the Tampa Bay area. We're coming to Tampa. Oh, good. Probably in October. Awesome. Yeah, I'll see you there. For Definitely. Sure. For sure, man. Well, I want to say very special thanks to... Roe Avon of Royal Avenue Media for arranging this interview with Jason Beeler. And you can so, pre-order it. What, when is the album officially coming out? What date? April 14th. Wow. April 14th. Right right before tax day. Exactly. Yeah. So people but, will feel like they have money until the next day. <laughs> but you can pre-order the album, Postcards from the Asylum by Jason Beeler and the Baron Von Bielski Orchestra. You can go to jasonbuehler.bandcamp.com. Right, we did a 250 red limited edition vinyl for the Bandcamp people. They've been so supportive of me, so we want to do something special for them. Then we're doing 250 yellow vinyl for all indie retail around right. the country, and then it'll go to black vinyl after that. So, oh, very cool. Bunch of cool, bunch of cool options and good, good. Dig it. Th- thank you so much for taking the time, my friend. Sure, man. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, I just want to say Heathens is out. You can listen to it on Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube. It's a great song. Um, you are on uh, your official websites, www.jasonbeeler.com. You're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Bandcamp. And I'm also putting all your discography on all my sites so people know all the albums they can purchase with you and Saigon Kick as well. Thank you so much, my friend. I really appreciate it. Thank you, man. Good luck to you. Keep up the good work. Great album. I love it. I'll see you in Tampa in the fall. That sounds great, man. Looking forward to it. Appreciate it. Bye-bye.